Hello, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this uh, APMG webinar today in partnership with Agile Change Management Limited and Outcome Academia. Uh, my name is Mark Constable. I'll be your host and moderator for the session. And uh, it's a delight to, delight to be joined by two presenters today, uh, Melanie Franklin and uh, Magda Kufredge. Uh, so we'll, uh, today we'll be looking at uh, some neuro hacks for implementing change in an agile way. So neuroscience is a quite po growing in popularity as a topic, um, and there's a lot we can take learn from it, if you like, from in, with regards to how we implement change. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, just before I hand over to our presenters, I will just cover a quick bit of housekeeping. So the first point to note is we are recording this session. Uh, and everyone that's registered will receive a follow-up email from me as soon as we've got the recording available online. So do look out for that. Um, secondly, you're welcome to submit questions at any stage. So you should be able to see Q&A function within the Zoom platform. Uh, so whenever you want to ask questions, do feel free to type them in. We'll be monitoring those closely as we go and we'll try and address as many as we can uh, before the end of the session. Uh, and last but not least, we welcome any feedback on the sessions. So uh, do let us know what you thought of the session, what you thought of the content, because uh, that always helps us with planning and delivering webinars in the future. Uh, so that's um, that's all I wanted to cover. So without further ado, I will hand things over to, to Magda to start with. So Magda, over to you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mark. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for this lunchtime session. I am myself very, very excited to hear from Melanie, who will give us a presentation about the neuro hacks that we can implement for a long lasting change. But before that, um, I would like, first of all, uh, ask you a few questions that will allow Melanie to understand who's in the audience. So uh, if we can start a poll, and the first question I would like to ask all of you that are here is, do you manage projects? Yes, full time, sometimes, occasionally, or no? Maybe not yet, or maybe you are already uh, finished with project management. So um, please vote, and then we're going to see how many of you are project management managers full-time or um, occasionally. Looks like we have quite a mix. Uh, we've okay. Got most votes in. I'll, I'll show the results in a second. But yeah, quite a mix. Just a little bit more time to vote if you haven't done it so. Close it there, so compile share results. Okay, so what we see is that the majority of you actually do manage projects. Are they full-time 36% or 51% sometimes occasionally? So Melanie, this is the first point for you to understand who's here with us. No, 14% of the audience. Okay, let's go to the second question, which is about whether you manage change as well. And uh, here we go. Do you manage change full time, sometimes, occasionally? No. That's the second question for today. We've got a lot of change managers because uh, very few are saying no. Mm -hmm. Right, let's close that one there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and here, what do we see? 52%, so a majority, 52%, just half of the audience is managing uh, change full-time and 46% occasionally with only 2% no out of 90 votes that we have here. So I think this is, Melanie, also very, very interesting piece of information for you because we see that you indeed are managing change and that can be a very uh, interesting webinar to learn those neuro hacks. And now finally, the last question, which comes a little bit with uh, managing change is about how much do you already know about neuroscience? Uh, literally nothing to, I consider myself an expert. I am a neuroscientist and perhaps I could help Melanie even with presenting uh, something about neuroscience. So please vote and let's see how many of you are already interested, keen on neuroscience, have been reading something about it, studying it. I can have a conversation, I studied it, or very basic knowledge, or maybe not at all. Okay, just a little bit more time for you. Quite a mix here, but no, no self-confessed experts at the moment. Okay. <laughs> 
not yet, not yet. Maybe after <laughs> this uh, webinar, there will be some inspiration to actually go into that path and become a neuroscience expert. Okay. okay there we go. There we go. So as you said, Mark, no experts here yet, except of uh, uh, Melanie, literally nothing, 37%. This is going to be an introduction for you. Only the very basics, 43%. So as we see, the majority of audience is uh, in early beginning of their journey towards uh, neuroscience uh, expertise. And then 15%, I can have a conversation about it. And a lot, I study a lot, 5%. Thanks a lot for that. I hope this is useful for you, Melanie. And now, without further ado, I want to just to present you so that everyone knows uh, who you are. You are uh, Melanie is a chartered management consultant, experience in change program and project management. She's an APMG accredited trainer on a variety of agile certifications. And she's also an author with her newest book coming up next year, Neuroscience for Business Transformation. So perhaps that is going to be that introduction that uh, will help you to, to get into neuroscience. And now without any further ado, please, Melanie, uh, you can uh, uh, show us your presentation and start. And I just want to repeat, if any of you wants to ask any question, please go ahead in our Q&A. We will be taking them live. Uh, and I hope you're gonna enjoy uh, this workshop. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, I'll keep the agenda really simple and um, what is neuroscience and i'm going to look at it from the change management perspective um, because our job is to try to encourage people to want to get involved and to actually change their ways of working and i'm interested in how an understanding of neuroscience can improve my communications make them more targeted make them more effective so we'll have a look at how neuroscience does that so why we need it how we apply it and we'll look at some neuro hacks we'll look at some really practical stuff because going on these webinars and just being told something that you should know isn't always helpful. I think just putting it into practical application is what we're after. So I'll zip through some of the uh, the, the stuff. Um, first of all, thinking about how our brains work then. Our brains are responsible for thinking. Um, but the thinking doesn't come first, interestingly. Um, our, our brains receive an awful lot of feeling messages from all over our senses, you know, so whether we can taste something, we can feel something, we can hear or see something. That Those messages, there's such a volume of them that our brain has to be able to do something with them very quickly. Um, so taking in all of those messages means we, we probably label things. And the quickest way to code something or to label something, as far as our brain is concerned, is to say, well, is it a threat or is it a reward? So is it is it something we're comfortable with or is it something we should be fearful of? Yeah. And of course, the brain is, is basically set up to protect us from threats um, and it will always seek reward. So this coding sort of triggers a couple of responses. So we have here the central nervous system, which is made up of the spinal cord and the brain. And then we have the peripheral nervous system. Very simply, there are two parts to that. Um, the sympathetic nervous system is responsible for what we probably all know as fight or flight. It's the adrenaline that increases our blood sugar, which generates a short term energetic response. It gives us enough energy to deal with the threat that we're experiencing. So knowing that I had to deliver this webinar today, um, I've, I've had a very long working day. I started at um, 7 a.m. And working through my day, there were points at which I definitely felt there was a threat response. As a deadline, for example, to this webinar loomed, I could feel that the energy was coming up. Um, so I tap into that to make sure that I'm, I'm getting I'm sorry, things done. Um, Melanie, I'm, I'm just going to in, uh, interrupt you just for a second, just to make sure that everyone in the audience can see your presentation. Because we uh, received a question here that someone asking whether we should be seeing a presentation from Melanie. Yes, you should okay. be seeing this presentation. I'll, put the so I'll, I'll reshare it now. Can you see it now? Thumbs up if you can see it. Thumbs down if you can't. I'm okay. guessing you can, Magda. I do. I can see it, but I think as a yeah. co-host, it's okay. probably the... Okay, we're oh, getting okay. some answers that at least one person can. And maybe I will already... So I hope that everyone can. I can see it. Okay, perfect. Sorry for the okay. little dis uh, distraction. No worries. 
and also receive the first question that maybe you'd like to address maybe a little bit later, which is, does this align with neurolinguistic programming? Um, yeah, neurolinguistic programming is a um, is a form of using an understanding of neuroscience um, to guide certain kinds of behavior. So it's exactly the same, if you like, as some of the neuro hacks. It's sort of basically taking an understanding of how the brain works and actually deciding how to do things. So from a neurolinguistic programming point of view, you might have heard of, for example, mirroring. Um, which is if I behave in a certain way, um, you might want to mirror my body language. Or if you decide to behave in a certain way, you're trying to encourage me to mirror your body language. Um, it's, a, it's an understanding of how the brain works based, it comes from an understanding of neuroscience. So yes, it's just another branch, if you like, in the neuroscience family. Um, so the sympathetic nervous system is fight or flight. That's where the energy comes from. So deadlines, fear that we're going to you know say the wrong thing or we don't know what we're talking about that certainly that fear made me grab my notes this morning and try to remind myself all the things I needed to say to you guys and then of course what we have the other system is the parasympathetic nervous system and this is all about rest and recuperation so when we're dealing with change it sort of takes over at the beginning because it puts us in denial um, because it's protecting us from, you know, the threats. It's sort of saying, well, don't worry. You don't need to deal with the threat. Just ignore it. It will be fine. And then once we realize that we have to change, we sort of swing into fight or flight mode. But then when we get to a point of accepting the change, we come back into that parasympathetic nervous system, that oh, okay, restful recuperation. So that's the basics. But what we're interested in, I think, more usefully for, for change is understanding this idea of threat or reward, because what we want to do is we need to decrease the feeling of threat and we need to increase the feeling of reward if we are going to get to a sustainable level of change. I don't want to ignore threat because... Um, as some of you may have studied um, in the past, uh, Professor Edgar Schein talked about survival anxiety, This uh, that we can create a sense of urgency for change if we make people feel the threat, feel that we cannot stay where we are. But that is something that we use very judiciously. It is if we kept that level of sort of energy, the demand for addressing the threat all of the time, people would easily get to a sort of burnout stage. So a lot of what we have to do in terms of change, I think, is orientating people towards the reward. But let's have a look. What happens when people do feel that threat? Well, as we've said, with the sympathetic nervous system, there is that adrenaline that we get. Um, the adrenaline, it's almost um, uh, my co-host for the Neuroscience for Change course, um, Tibby talks about um, adrenaline as being sort of the uh, the big drum in the orchestra where you can really feel the boom, boom, boom all the time. It keeps the sort of pace going. At the same time, you get noradrenaline or norepinephrine if you're in the US, um, which gives us hypervigilance. We become incredibly focused on what it is we're trying to achieve. So we have more of the energy. And we have this hypervigilance that basically cuts out all other distractions while we focus in the, on this one thing. So you might not notice anything else happening while you are trying to fix this thing. And then as the noradrenaline and the adrenaline come down, you start to become aware of your wider circumstances. So it's not a state that we want to be in forever. And we also have the production of cortisol, which, again, is useful in small bursts for getting us to do things, but it's, it's, it's something that if we had it forever, it's a pernicious, it would be very hurtful to us. It would end up actually giving us the sort of the counter um, uh, reaction that we want because we, again, we're back to that burnout stage. Reward, where we want to focus our energies, gives us a sense of positive feelings, which encourage us to see the change as a sort of a good thing. Now, the chemical reactions that we can create if we're using an understanding of the brain. I want to create dopamine. Dopamine gives us energy and motivation because we feel that we're making progress. We feel a sense of achievement. Dopamine comes from when, for example, we've posted something on Facebook and we get likes. 
because every single like is a, oh somebody liked that i'm valued oh that feels good that's dopamine um, I had a, I, I decided because of the level of adrenaline I had been experiencing over the last few days to give myself um, this opportunity for a sense of reward. So for a couple of hours this morning, I turned off all distractions and I worked through every follow up note from every meeting that I've had this week and at the end of last week. And every time I finished something, every time I closed something out, and what I did was I physically marked it in my notebook with a big cross through it because I wanted to send my brain the message, it's done. I could feel that sense of dopamine, that ooh, that pleasant chemical in the brain, which also leads to endorphins, which trigger pleasure um, and they help reduce pain as well. Another thing that I did to create those endorphins and to get that hit of dopamine today was I sent out um, a, a message, I think on LinkedIn about an hour, a couple of hours ago to say to people, this is the last time I'll be doing a webinar on neuroscience this year. We're six weeks away from the end of the year. And it was great to tell my brain, you don't have to hold on to all of this information, this particular presentation anymore. If you can put that aside, that's finished. And so my brain was ticking off, that's finished. That's good, I feel good. And I was very aware that those two hours of uninterrupted progress that I was making without being distracted by other emails, which if they have threatening messages, like a reminder of a deadline, pull me back into the threat, pull me back into the adrenaline and the norepinephrine. That's unpleasant. So I gave myself a couple of hours of reward where I, I, I sat there with the dopamine, the endorphins. And the other thing is... The oxytocin, working with other people, collaborating with people to solve problems, that's a lovely chemical that's generated in the brain because it's all about bonding. So it's when we're working with others, when we feel trust. So you can probably start to see that there's a lot of good stuff we can make use of when it comes to this neurochemical reaction in the brain. We can actually decide which one we want to try to create. Definitely the threat will give energy and a sense of urgency, not sustainable, but reward makes us feel good and makes us want to repeat something as well, makes us want to do it again. So what we want to do is bring our understanding of this to hack the brain by creating the responses that we need. Um, so I think it's been really interesting running the pilot courses for the neuroscience for change because so many people are really interested in this sort of chemical reaction. And it's almost as if what we're, we're trying to do here is use the recipe to get the reaction that we want. Um, I want a rapid sense perhaps of achievement and progress because it creates that dopamine. Um, and if I want to also support that with sort of a feeling of doing it with others, I can decide to, to work with others and get that oxytocin. Maslow got there first, though, didn't he, in his hierarchy of needs, when he talked about our need for love and belonging. And that's absolutely true. So that pushes us to, to feel, you know, more on the reward than the threat. And that makes us feel better about the change. Um, and we can also draw at this moment on the learnings from the School of Positive Psychology, because we know that that good feeling increases our creativity. Um, it increases our ability to process lots more information. It increases our ability to commit and, and keep going. So everything about the reward end of this is pointing more towards resilience. Um, that feeling also of that desire to collaborate with others, which, as we've said, creates the oxytocin, which makes us want to collaborate more. So that creates a, a very virtuous circle. And to be honest, all of those things about positivity is what we need for change. I need people to be resilient because wave after wave of change is going to make them feel exhausted. We need them to be at their most creative because change is something we've never done before. So we're going to have to create the answers as we go. So by creating the right chemical reaction in the brain, I'm actually creating the right conditions for the change that we need. What got me into this, this, you know, I'm a, I'm a very practical person and I've been managing change initiatives around the world for, for several decades. 
But in the last decade, you know, I realized that I needed to tighten up on how I facilitate change, how I increase resilience because of the volume of change that is taking place at any one time. I've just finished doing the um, Global Capability for Change survey. And if you want more on the results of that, uh, Mark Constable at APMG has arranged a webinar in uh, uh, mid-December on this. But it's basically telling us again that we're overwhelmed by the volume of change. So I, I need to, to manage people's creativity. I need to focus on their well-being in an environment where people are losing the plot. There's so much changing all at the same time. How do they cope? And I think it was that reason, this is all part of my reasoning in why do I need to use neuroscience now? Why have, why do I think that the, the, the change profession that we're in, why, why do we think neuroscience is the best way forward for us? And I only have to look at my stakeholder analysis to, to sort of basically tell me that maybe things aren't quite right in that I can use sort of um, here I've used the CPIG model for customers, providers, influencers and governance. But there's lots of ways in which I can sort of identify who my stakeholders are. But the problem I have with a lot of that is that it is based on what their job titles are or what they are supposed to be interested in based on the role that they have within their organisation, the responsibilities that they have in a racy table. So I can create messages based on their position in the change, the role they're supposed to be playing, their job title. The problem is they bounce right off. Similarly, I can use these matrices to sort of slice and dice my, um, my stakeholders based on how much impact, uh, how much interest do they have, how much influence do they have over the change. So what the effect of the change is on them and therefore what they should be interested in, how much they should be interested. But again, based on this, a lot of my messages bounce right off. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to rubbish these ideas at all. I think they are very important parts of um, our armory, our toolkit in being able to identify and analyze our stakeholders. But I think what this does is often gives me the content of the messages, what I, I need them to know and do, but it doesn't make me the most persuasive force. I can use the ideal chemical reactions in the brain to get people to take notice of what I need to say and to want to get involved in what it is that I'm going to say. So I think it's just thinking, I'm not trying to rubbish what we already have. I'm just trying to make sure that we use it to the best ability. So if I want to land my messages, if I want to make a difference, how do I do that? Where does neuroscience come in? And I think we're going back to the fact that if I've got the content right, I then go and make a logical argument. I try and explain all the reasoning behind something, the rationale for the change, the drivers for change, the benefits of the change. And they bounce right off. Well, in a world where I think with the high volume of change, what we've got is very busy people. But we've also got, I think, increased cynicism because there is so much change happening. Um, what makes your change stand out from the 10 others that a manager has got to try and implement this month? I also think that increased cynicism is a product of the volume of change, because with a higher volume of change, there is a higher chance that some changes around us are failing. So people are thinking, well, that was a load of wasted effort. So why should I get involved in this change? So I've personally seen how much more difficult my job is than it's ever been before. As the volume of change increases, it's very difficult to get people's attention. Because the other thing is, I might be sort of telling engaging stories about my change, very persuasive stories about my change, but they're kind of bouncing right off. Why? Well, I'm in a crowded marketplace. I'm not the only one talking to my stakeholders about changes and telling them that their involvement is absolutely essential and we can't do it without them. 
I'm in a, a crowded marketplace. I love um, something that somebody from a portfolio office said to me recently about um, he was looking at levels of change saturation. We often talk about change fatigue, but I think I love the word saturation because I think that's where we're up to. So if I'm going to cut through all of that other noise and get my messages, not just heard, but actioned, what I want is almost a visceral response, an automatic response. The brain is basically being hooked in the right way that it can't help react in the way that I want it to. And so I will use neuroscience and we're going to look at some of the neuro hacks in just a moment to create the right messages, the brain friendly messages based on I want to reduce pain. I want to increase pleasure. I want to increase a level of empowerment and autonomy. I want to minimize the amount of energy required for change. At the same time, I want to sort of um, maximize the energy people feel for the change. I want to increase certainty. I want to reduce threat, increase reward. Understanding how the brain works, I think, and certainly my experience has been, it, in, it just gives me a whole new set of tools where I can be much sharper, much more focused, much more effective, because I'm not just giving people content based on, well, this is your job title, so you should want to know about this. The message bounces right off. I think we can use neuroscience to make a really big difference. So now I'm going to take you through some of the, the sort of the hacks, the ways in which we can do that, if you like. But before that, Magda, have you got any questions about neuroscience? Anybody want to put anything up before I move on to the practical application of it? We don't have anything yet in q and A, but I encourage everyone. I see it's already extremely interesting. Thanks a lot, Melanie, for that and the rewards that we all need to you know, continue. So I'm just going to see any questions coming up. This is your time to ask the questions about the first part of the webinar with Melanie about the uh, chemical reactions going on in our, in our brain. Yeah, we have a lot of fun with that on the neuroscience course. It's um, I don't think when we wrote the course, we realized just how much people would be really interested. But it really makes you think about what effect is what I'm doing. For example, if I want to increase the reward um, feeling about a change, one of the things I can do is think about oxytocin, which comes from bonding and working with others in a shared goal. So suddenly I start to realize that actually I can create increase that feeling of reward if I just mention other people who are also involved in the change um, or I can create activities where people are doing things more together than they're doing them alone so just understanding some of the very basic ideas of how the brain works can make me stop and think I could improve what I'm what I'm doing right now I could improve the the likelihood that it people will participate, the likelihood that they'll feel good about what I'm asking. So just understanding some of those brain chemicals makes the difference. Okay, uh, Melanie, before you move on, I think we have the, the first question, uh, which is actually we have more questions coming now. So if we have five minutes, we're gonna take them. Do you use neural networks and deep learning in your area? That's one of the questions we got. Uh, um, maybe I, mm -hmm. you can go. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, no, I think the thing is, um, I think the thing to think about here is that we're trying to keep this at a very simple and practical level. Um, and so you're getting a really good flavor for some of the underpinning thinking that we're looking for. I mean, neural networks, absolutely. It's, um, it is, a, you could connect that back to oxytocin, you could connect that back to collaboration. There's absolutely nothing wrong with these things. If you know about them, yes, you could see that they could link up, but I'm certainly not gonna make a, any specific uh, reference to them on, on, on this webinar, no. Uh. Okay. Thanks so much for taking this question. And we have another one, which is, how do we factor in the challenge of improving EDI in organizations with neuroscience, for example, that is, neuro inclusion and roles which would benefit from more neurodivergent people in posts yeah i think it's a i think it's an interesting question i think that you it's much easier to be empathetic to the needs of the brain after all when we talk about neurodivergent diver, um it's basically that um, some people's brains are working in uh, a, a slightly different way. They're, they've got a bit more emphasis about some things than others. 
Um, and to me, that's just um, actually a wider perspective. So I welcome it. I really welcome it. And I think uh, you can see it less as um, being more as uh, I think some people can see neurodiversity still as a disability. And I think the more that they learn about neuroscience, the less likely that is to be the case. They're just seeing actually people's brains work on a spectrum and some brains like this more and some brains like this more. And I think that can be very helpful in sort of almost leveling the playing field. I completely agree with you. I think it's going from black and white to all shades of gray and basically we're all different. And that also is, uh, it's because of our brains are different. Okay, uh, another question that came is, and that's more philosophical and I think it would deserve a completely a full discussion. Maybe we can do it one day, a follow-up. Where is the border between manipulation and neuroscience? I think that we all make our own decisions on that. When I'm training the Agile Change Coach course, it's got 41 neuro hacks in it. And I am very honest and say at the beginning of the course, some of these you'll like, and some of these you won't. Everybody's got a different point at which they go, mm, I think that's shaping, that's manipulating um, because you're deciding what you're putting in front of people and um, you know the reaction is gonna create. Um, and other people go, oh, no, that's a useful tool. So it is in the eye of the beholder, to be fair. Of course. Thanks for that. I think that if we had more people from marketing here, I think it would be also an interesting discussion because those things are also used in that discipline. I'll let you move on. I don't see more questions here for now, but we're going to take some more later. And for all of you, please feel free, ask the questions already now, and then we'll be taking them in batches. So uh, Melanie, please go ahead. Okay, no worries. Right, well, I'll get on to the practicalities of this then. Um, so, as I said, some of the, I, I can choose certain actions that will have a reaction in the brain. One of the things I might want to do is to decrease the pain associated with change. When we see the change as a threat, um, we are experiencing pain um, and therefore something that we want to avoid. Um, we can inc we can decrease that pain by the way in which we encourage people to engage with our change. Um, I've just used this from the Agile Change Agent course. Um, this is the matrix where we talk about what is it that we enjoy doing? What is it that we find easy to do? Um, and if you can offer people genuine empowerment and, and ways in which they can get in, choose to get involved in your change, then they can play to their talents. I mean, we see this in um, intrinsic motivation all the time, that if we're playing to our talents and our mastery and we're doing things that we genuinely enjoy, then actually the pain of the change goes away because we're getting the enjoyment from the thing that we're doing that helps make the change happen. There is absolutely um, a virtuous circle here in terms of doing things that we enjoy. Also, um, we, 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 if you like, we get a lot of that dopamine from doing that. We get the endorphins, the pleasure chemicals, and therefore we're more likely to want to do more of that task as well. Marcus Buckingham, who um, was uh, always associated with the Strengths Finder model, if you know that one, um, wrote in the Harvard Business Review last summer because he was launching his new book. Um, the Harvard Business Review article is great. The book, not so good, in my opinion. Um, but he was talking about from the Mayo Clinic, the research is that as long as we spend 20% of every day doing something that we enjoy, it doesn't, it's not something you can save up to the rest of the week and just have one afternoon where you're enjoying your work. There have to be 20% throughout the day. The total summation of what you've enjoyed doing has to be at least a fifth. It doesn't actually have to be anything higher than about a fifth. Um, and we start to feel really motivated from what we're doing. And that's how I deliberately, and, and it's a game we play on the Neuroscience for Change course, this is how I deliberately organise my day today. So I, I came in at the crack of, well, way before sun, sunrise, to be fair. It wasn't even the crack of dawn. Uh, but I came in really early. I got a load of stuff done. And I had that two hours where I just gave myself the opportunity to feel I'd made progress and I had achievements and that I was working in a way that just quiet, reflective working where and more strategic stuff that I needed to get done that I really gained pleasure from. So I was working in my top right corner this morning. And that has powered me. It's motivated me for the rest of my day and probably for the rest of my week. And considering I haven't had a, a, a much of a break in, in the last few weeks, that it was a deliberate decision to use neuroscience to give me the energy to keep going. 
we can use the team transparency model. When you are bringing people together for the first time, you can get them to share, well, what is it that you find easy? What is it that you like doing? Now, that isn't to say that people can only spend their time just on those tasks, but it does enable you to set yourself up as, look, I'm very happy to volunteer for this. Um, and knowing that you have an opportunity to volunteer for certain pieces of work that you are really going to enjoy, then in that way, um, and when you sort of get this picture of mixing it up with everybody else, you feel the oxytocin because you're part of that team and you can see that you have a, a big contribution to make within the team. On that, your skills, your preferences are a, a, a great fit for other people. And therefore you feel that you're adding real value to that team, which again, really increases the, you know, that oxytocin. So there we go. We can decrease the pain associated by change by allowing people to self-select what it is they get involved in. And this also leads to a way in which we can increase pleasure. I've just put up a very simple um, team charter here. But one of the ways that we increase the pleasure associated with change, we're, we're back to dopamine and oxytocin, but it's about I'm working with you. We have a shared common goal. We have a shared feeling of the, the purpose of the team and that I'm, I can see where I fit into that. I can see what my responsibilities are. I can see how we're going to work together. And what, of course, what this also does is it gets rid of one of the, the big triggers for threat within the brain, which is uncertainty. Our brains are pattern recognition machines. They like to know what's coming up next. And whenever we are confronted with something new and different, we are incredibly uncomfortable because our brains are going, I don't know how this is going to work. I don't know what's going to happen next. And actually, that's something that our brains are trying to avoid. Uncertainty is something that triggers a very immediate threat response. The brain doesn't know what the next few steps are. It can't look ahead. And therefore, we get this, I don't know what's going to happen next. It's a real threat response. I was saying earlier in the summer when I was doing a, a, a webinar on um, neuroscience that I got locked into my office here. Um, and I'm in a glass box with a couple of desks in um, and I don't know how they managed it, but it was, I finished at eight o'clock that night. As I closed down my laptop, my brain was already going, close down the laptop, stand up, walk over to the door, press down the handle, pull the door towards you, walk out the door, turn left, walk out the other door and into the car park. My brain, because it's a pattern recognition machine, it likes certainty, it knew what was coming up. As soon as I pressed down the door handle and pulled it towards me and it didn't come because I was locked in, I, there was a visceral response. I could feel the heat moving up the back of my neck and this, this, the chemical, the flooding of those chemicals in the brain, all to do with threat the adrenaline, I could feel the energy and I could feel the focus. The only thing I could think about was I can't get out. I can't get out. So we, we know how sort of threat feels. We want to increase instead the pleasure, the feeling of, oh, I'm in control. I have certainty. And therefore, you know, I'm safe to proceed. This is something that I think we the phrase that I use a lot in change in my own head and we say it to my stakeholders but what I'm trying to do is lay out a plan. And I think the Agile Roadmap, the planning technique and the Agile Change Agent of course is really helpful because it's a very visual sort of plan that says what's coming up next and what's coming up next without getting into all the detail, which is definitely overload for the brain. But certainly if we can, we can think about, I'm telling my brain what's coming up next, it makes it feel sure and certain and that's a very pleasurable thing. So the team charter is definitely a part of this. Yeah. But also, um, so, yeah. Sorry, can I ask, uh, can I just uh, interrupt you now for another batch of a few questions while you're going through Neurohacks because we got one specific question about how sustainable is it? How sustainable can the change be with those Neurohacks that you are presenting right now? Well, if you let's unpick what sustainability for change is. Sustainability for change is that actually we continue to work in the new way and we don't roll back to the old ways of working when we hit a bit of a problem. 
And I think what you find with neuroscience is that you've got people earlier involved, you've got them more committed to be involved, therefore they are more likely to move through that cycle of, I don't know what I'm doing, and then I practice it and it starts to feel more comfortable and I practice it some more and it continues to be more comfortable until it becomes a new habit, it becomes the new norm. That is sustainable change. And I think with neuroscience, this is a part of increasing the the willingness of people to get involved in the change and also increasing the number of those people who are willing to get involved in the change because the messaging we're giving them is really hitting home and making their brains go I'll try it because we're reducing the threat and increasing the reward so I think absolutely it goes to the basics of sustainable change which is the volume of people who are willing to work in the new way and the ability of those people to keep working even when they hit problems. Great, great, great. And also what you said earlier on that the positivity makes us, generally speaking, behave in a more sustainable way, taking care of our well-being. I think it all goes hand in hand. Now, uh, we also got a comment which says that uh, it sounds like the working genius model that Patrick Lencioni advocates. I hope I don't mispronounce the name. But generally speaking, about the interest and doing the things that we're good at. So I guess it's also just a um, part of the of this uh, school of thought. And then we also have a question, which I'm not sure if I can understand. Maybe, Melanie, you will. Otherwise, we'll ask Antoinette for a um, more specific. So do you think hacks become less successful as your impacted population increases because you have a wider spectrum motivators in the population? That is the tasks people enjoy differ from one person to the next. Well, I think that's why you need a very wide range of uh, different activities, different neuro hubs. But the drivers in the brain, the, the key points at which we're sort of pushing remain the same. So it knowing that, for example, that I want to f enable people to feel valued and respected because that will increase their pleasure um, feeling that they have a sense of status within the team. It might be that some people enjoy this, uh, this idea of, of the team charter and forming that team and how the team is going to work. Equally, people, um, other people would be inspired and feel valued and motivated um, because we're asking them to coach or mentor others during the change, which is something that they get a great deal of a, a feeling of status and a feeling of respect from. Um, and therefore, it's just another type of technique that we would apply. So I think absolutely, uh, the, I've got one, I've got a change at the moment, it's got 120,000 stakeholders. Um, so I think we've got a full representation of the, the, the human race there in terms of what the preferences are. And it's about, I, I mean, I have a, a couple of hundred neuro hacks that I use um, and it, it's putting things in, in front of people. And it goes back to that choice piece, giving people that opportunity to choose how would you like to get involved? If I tried to compel you to coach somebody and that's not something that you enjoy and that you find easy, and I've compelled you to do it, so I've taken away your autonomy, then absolutely that's not going to work. Equally, if I put, could you coach or mentor others? Um, could you uh, facilitate this workshop? Could you create the return on investment model through, you know, through Excel spreadsheets, please? Um, could you design new ways of working and, and run a process workshop? There's lots of different ways that people can get involved. Um, so I think we have to allow people to play to their strengths. I wish you could present all the over 100 uh, hacks that you have, but uh, <laughs> unfortunately not in this time frame today. And uh, last two questions uh, coming from the uh, same uh, account. Is your area near to cybernetics? And how do you find internal motivation to start the day with tough task? And from then on, I'm going to let you uh, continue to present because we only have 15 minutes left. Yeah, so, well, I, sometimes people will start the day with tough tasks because what they enjoy from that is the challenge and that gives them an amazing amount of dopamine. Other people will start their day with very small and simple tasks um, and that they can accomplish very quickly because that will give them a sense of achievement and the dopamine. So again, I think it always comes back to the fact that everybody um, has different ways of doing things. And what we want to do in change is give people the opportunity to work in a way that makes them happy but it, it's knowing that we have all these different options and we have to keep 
advertising them. It's almost like we're presenting people with a menu of ways in which they can contribute to our change that will really help them. But there are some things that perhaps I'll just go on to some other neuro hacks that are very important in terms of uh, understanding how the brain works and maybe um, making it easier for people. This one here is that, um, I'm just gonna check, yeah. Uh, I'll go to this one here, for example, just um, that if our brains understand what needs to happen, we go from A to B um, and there's no interruption, there's a certainty there, then the amount of energy that our brains need to use is not that great. But as soon as you put options in front of people and they're, because there's uncertainty, well, we might end up doing that or we might have to do that or we might have to do that then the brain has to form new associations, new neural pathways between those options. So if you like, we talk about the neural load, that the amount of processing goes up, the amount of energy the brain has to apply goes up. I mean, our brains are only about 3% of our body weight, but they are using about 20% of our oxygen. And our brains are in a very privileged position because they get the oxygen first and they keep it. Um, so we have to think mm, energy wise, it would be really helpful if we could make this as simple as possible. So let's decrease the, the number of decisions. I was only saying to a group last night, I know um, in a couple of weeks, I have an incredibly busy week coming up where I'm working in a variety of different countries and I've just got to keep it all together for five days. What is it that I'm going to do to decrease the neural load on my brain? Well, one of them is that before the week starts, I will work out what my clothes are for every single day, for every event that I'm going to, and just pile them up in the wardrobe in the order in which I'm going to wear them, because that just gets rid of that decision. It might not look like a big decision, but it's another decision that my brain has to take. And every decision takes energy. So whatever it is I can do to keep things running smoothly, all to the good. That's what I'm looking for. And that means, I think, that one of the things that we can usefully do is, um, I'll just go back a slide now. One of the things that we can usefully do um, in decreasing the energy is we can think about breaking our change into smaller and smaller and more specific pieces. By doing this, one of the things that happens is that we get to, to understand uh, and increase the certainty of our change because we know that it's the, these are the outcomes. And then for each outcome, we can break it into actions and then break it into tasks. So there is something here, a very agile planning technique, actually, because it's all about breaking the change into smaller and smaller pieces. We can then obviously do a selection of these pieces iteration by iteration. So if you're looking at the Agile Change course, you can find the, the Agile Roadmap. Very simple, very visual planning technique is based on the idea that we'll do a small amount, get the achievement from it, really enjoy the achievement from it, and then move on to the next bit. So under, underlying this is this ability. Uh, it's a skill to be able to break something down from its, its, its uh, a huge mass into a lot smaller techniques. So you could something you could practice every day, because if you start in the habit of writing yourself a to do list, but then taking each of those items on the to do list and breaking it down into specific actions and then potentially taking one of those actions and breaking it down into all the tasks needed for that action, you start to get into this habit of decomposition, which is incredibly important because each one of those things we can now see maybe I can put it into this sort of flow. So along the bottom there, I know how things fit together. Equally, you know, um, I can increase the, the sort of um, the energy from change because I'm actually thinking, well, do you know what? We can use all those little pieces um, and we can work out a pattern for doing it and that I can tick each one of them off and go, oh, well, if I've implemented it for the local customers. Now I can roll it out for the national customers. Now I can roll it out for the overseas customers. Iteration after iteration of success, you know, and that's going to make me feel really good. You know, or maybe I can sort of think about I can work through something quite big by having broken it all down so I can tick things off until I go, I've done all of the initial pieces. I've done all the bits in the middle and now I've done all the closing pieces. 
and get through things one after the other. But all of this keeps hitting home with this idea of dopamine um, and feeling a sense of achievement. So there's an awful lot in agile, the agile ways of working around things like the roadmap, iterative working, the evolving solution, but also underpinned by collaboration that is all incredibly brain friendly, which is probably why it works so effectively. Last one I'll talk about is how the brain does not like surprises. The brain likes to know what's coming up next. So if expectation is met with reality, the brain just sails on quite happily and everything's fine. But when you have something where it doesn't meet expect, uh, expectation, even if it's a positive gain, the brain is still sending an error message. And when the brain sends an error message, it's a threat, isn't it? It's of like, oh, I need to be on alert. So we're back to that norepinephrine again, sort of focusing in on this thing because it's not exactly as we expected. But when we get something that is expected, we're very happy. Um, when we get something that's not expected, maybe it's a more of a loss. Again, we're still not happy because it, it's not meeting expectations. How do we apply this when it comes to change initiatives? Well, one of the things we have to think about is actually... Um, talking to people and getting people to ask us lots of questions and to engage so that they clarify their expectations. I play a game in one of my courses, which is around scope and exclusions, where we get rid of any imagined change so that their expectations, no, it's just this that's changing and not all the other things they might have assumed. We are clarifying what is expected to change so that there's a much greater chance that what they experience and what they're expecting is uh, in line. Because I know that as soon as there's any misunderstanding, we know misunderstandings upset people, but we now know why the brain says, hang on, we've gone off at a tangent. That wasn't expected. It triggers the threat response in the brain. And that is a very uncomfortable feeling for us as human beings. No, so I see that we only have around five minutes left. There are still three questions waiting for you. I wonder if you'd like to take them now or uh, still continue. Absolutely. All I was going to say is you can see that I think we are, certainly my experience has been in this industry for the last 30 years, that I can see that we are at a turning point um, and that actually we are, um, we're moving towards, you know, actually addressing uh, maybe putting neuroscience into our profession. So I think agility is something that we've been adopting within change. And, and actually a lot of that agility and when it works is because it's driven by um, neuroscience, it's driven by the School of Positive Psychology. Perfect, thanks for this. I noted a few hacks that you mentioned, including uh, less decisions, smaller pieces, collaborations with other, basically anything that can help us with the level of dopamine. Thanks for a lot for that. Now, a few questions that we still have. Number one, will social prof profiling help with neurohacks for change? No. That's a very clear, very short answer. <laughs> but, um, I, uh, no, I think um, that uh, social profiling takes away choice, doesn't it? Because you have to, you're, what you're doing is you're profiling something and saying, I know better than them. I know exactly what it is that they want. I think it, be careful, just always go ask, don't tell. Offer people a menu of things that they might want to get involved in. Don't try to pre-choose for them, Not don't try to pre-select. Um, I see the, there's an anonymous attendee there. Um, I haven't mentioned um, uh, David Rock's work, the SCARF model, um, which I absolutely love. Um, I think uh, David Rock, it, it's, it's actually one of my favourite books. And when I want inspiration, I go back and listen to David. And if you haven't got it already, I do recommend it on the audio book, actually, because it's just it's it's beautifully written and it's lovely to listen to. Um, so I definitely think that that's a good one. Uh, OK, I guess you also see other questions, but uh, maybe yeah. the, the question about Kaizen, uh, whether this technical technique can also be used to put things into perspective and break it down into smaller pieces i think that well i can see whoever jared meetup is that, that what they've done is they've, they've obviously got a lovely textbook out there and they're just going to ask me whether or not it connects to this 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 and this um so i'll, I'll let them make their own decision on that i think okay i think that's uh, fair enough 
And now we're going back to your book, which will come up next year. So I see that you already have a few people who are waiting and wants to make sure they're going to be the first one to read because the question is whether you are going to talk about all the 100 neuro, neuro hacks that you mentioned today. And also what are the top three, the three golden neuro hacks that you could propose for a small a change to bring positive uh, outcome? What is maybe your favorite or the one you think is the most efficient? Uh, good grief. Well, I'm going to be lecturing on um, neuro hacks this afternoon. And I would say things like uh, one of the things that I absolutely love is um, uh, thinking about um, delay discounting in that uh, the further out um, we go in terms of time, the, the more our brain discounts the impact, the risk, the power of what we're talking about. Um, this is why the pensions industry, the funeral industry have so so many problems trying to acquire customers because it seems so far away. Why should we bother? And I think we're all experiencing the delay discounting. So it'll probably be the last thing I can talk about. We're running out of time um, because actually um, because Christmas is coming and I bet all of us are doing exactly the same thing. Delay discounting means that we're saying to ourselves, oh, I'll get that done in January because I've only got five weeks to Christmas. Um, but actually, um, with the brain is sort of, oh, January is so far away, I can't, cause I can't imagine it. So I'll just put things into January. And when you get to January, you realise you've overstuffed January quite considerably because you think, good grief, what was I thinking in November and December? It's because we can't imagine January at the moment. So we don't have the pressure that actually January is already full. So there's a classic example of one of those. I see, I see. Melanie, there is also quite a lot of interest in the in the book by Rock that you uh, suggested about the scarf model. So maybe that's also something you could mention what the title is. And we can also send it later in a follow up email, including uh, that publication. Absolutely fine. Um, I'm sure people can look on Amazon for other people's books. Not my job to advertise them. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think what you actually want to look at is the Agile Change Management Handbook uh, by Melanie Franklin. I think that's the key one to look for. Um, I'm going to go because uh, uh, yes. I know that it's the end of the workshop. So thank you very thank much. You very I much. think uh, we ought to put this one up here uh, because I know that uh, the uh, accredited trainee organisation that uh, arranged this uh, uh, very valuable webinar um, is very keen to help you develop your skills and they're even going to make it financially far more able for you to do that. So definitely get hold of them, book their courses. Uh, they're a great training organization, and I think we should give them their, our full support. Thank you, Melanie. Thanks for joining us today. There were also many comments saying how useful and brilliant this session was. So thanks for sharing your experience and giving us those hacks that now we can start to implement also in our own lives. So also a question to all of you, all the participants, please, you can still write in Q&A, what is one behavioral change that now after this workshop you would like to implement, introduce in your life? And we're also gonna ask you for a, a little poll to tell us if you like this session or not. And I'm gonna say goodbye to Melanie because I know she has to run to another workshop, a very busy woman. Thanks, so Melanie. thanks a lot for being with us. It's been a pleasure, thank you. Okay, so I'm just looking at the Q&A, if there is anything about the uh, behavioral changes that uh, you are ready to implement after this, but I don't see a lot. No, not so much, but the implementation of the reward trigger that was something that was suggested. And I see it's one of the tips that is gonna be taken over later for uh, by our participants. Okay, Mark, would you still like to share, uh, run the poll? Uh, yes, yeah, let's get that poll up. And whilst I'm doing that, I'll just say um, about the, the special offer that I'll come off when we'll, we'll include more details in the follow up email. So do look up, out for that because there'll be that there'll be links through to the eligible courses in the follow up email. But let's get the uh, final one. So we'd just lo love to know what you thought of the session today. So we just got a, a simple one to five ranking. Uh, one being uh, not so good, five being excellent. And of course, we'll also share those results with Mel Melanie who had to leave. But thanks a lot for all of you that are still here and uh, ready to provide us with feedback because that's also a very, very important part. Yeah, thanks very much, everyone. So I think we'll close that one there. Uh, so that's all the polls. So 
I think that's nearly it, isn't it, Magda? So I think we can sign off there. Um, so if, just, I'll just say thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, I hope you've uh, the the results of the poll suggest you found it interesting and informative. So that's really good. Um, and yeah, thank you for your time for joining us today, and thank you, Magda, for your support for the session. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye.